God bless you all and welcome to Grace Point, where it's our desire for you to encounter God, serve the world, and grow in community. I'm Paula, the admin assistant here at the church. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we want to let you know that we're blessed to have you with us. At this time, I want to invite anyone who's still in the lobby to come into the sanctuary and find a seat. Service will begin shortly, but first, here's some information for you. As a church, we believe that the Bible is God's word, and it is the authority for life and faith. To learn all the fundamentals of what we believe, you can scan the QR code and see our full statement of faith. I also want to invite you to come out to attend our prayer meeting every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. This is where we come together as one body and cry out to the Lord. It's our most important meeting of the week, so I hope to see many of you there. Are you new to Grace Point? Whether today is your first time joining us in person or online, or you've been here a few weeks but haven't connected yet, text WELCOME to 845-210-9911. We also invite you to visit our Welcome Center in the lobby after service. We have a gift for you. If you don't have a church that you call home, then I want to invite you to be a part of what God is doing right here at Grace Point. Parents, if you have children aged pre-K through sixth grade, we hold a service for them in our G Kids Clubhouse. Our nursery is also open for child care for kids three and under. To check your children in, come out to the G Kids desk in the lobby. That wraps us up for now. I know the Lord has something special planned for us today, so let's all press in and give him our all as we lift our hands in worship. Amen. Good morning, church. Why don't we stand to our feet? It's good to see you guys. It's good to be in God's house with you. This morning I was sharing with the worship team, Psalms 118, 24. God just began to encourage me over the weekend. And it says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And this is why it encouraged me. God began to just remind me, when you and I make something, we typically know everything that's involved in that. If you make a cake, you know the ingredients. If you build something, if you build a shed, you, you know the pieces that you have to put together in order for that shed to last. Today, God knows today because he made today. And so because he knows everything that's going to happen today, he knows everything that's going to concern you, our confidence can be put right back in him. Amen. Is your confidence in him today? Are you concerned about everything, anything today? I hope you lay that down at the feet of Jesus and allow him to comfort you. Lord, we love you. We thank you, God. You are good. You are faithful. We bless you. Oh 
I trust God and I trust in God my Savior the one who will never fail yes I trust in God I trust in God
Trust in God, my Savior, the one, yes, Lord, who will never fail. Thank you, Jesus. To trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the Thank you. 
one more time. Jesus.
but do you remember what the Lord brought you out of? Remember how he's made you new. Remember how he's paid the price for you to have life and breath in your lungs this morning. It was only because of the grace of God that we're standing here this morning. It is only because of the faithfulness of the Lord. It is only because of his goodness and his mercy that follows us. All the days of our life as we dwell in the house of the Lord, it is only because of him.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. Good morning, church. How many of you guys are excited for God's goodness, his faithfulness, his trust? We get to experience this in the land of the living, as the Bible says. We're excited to be here this morning. Psalm 34, verse 6 says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. How many of you guys have been saved out of troubles? God rescued you when you shouldn't have been rescued. He's a faithful God, a good God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Church, can we just raise our hands and say thank you to the God of all creation. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We sung about it all morning. Your faithfulness is good. Thank you, Jesus. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we just want to say thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your everlasting goodness. Lord, we can look to you and our faces be radiant. That's your word. Your promise, oh God. You're the lifter of our heads, oh Lord. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, that this person, we can, we can cry out and your word says you hear us. And not only can you hear us, you rescue us. And a lot of us know where we've been rescued from. So, Father, we just want to say thank you for your faithfulness this morning. It's not enough just to sing it. We want to say thank you from the heart for your goodness and faithfulness this morning, Lord. Mercies are new each morning. Father, we love you and we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's children said amen. amen and God bless you. May you greet one another. May you just love on each other's church. God bless you, Brother James. His birthday's in two days. It'll be 76. God bless our brother James, God bless you. Oh my gosh, I almost dropped my word. Can't do that now in church. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> oh, at that southern call. <laughs> anyway, guys, uh, we're going to continue to give God uh, our praise and our worship and the giving of our tithes and offering. And I just want to share something. Um, I just, I just felt led to share this. Um, I asked my wife permission before sharing this. So um, before we give, let me just share hard because I know this could be a difficult time, right? Um, when my daughter was about six months old, uh, my wife had decided at the time that she was going to take off from work. She's going she's gonna to try to be a stay-at-home mother <clears throat> at that time. And we were living in a city, and it was very expensive, and our income was cut drastically because my wife was no longer working and I was, um, you know, just, it was really tough. It was difficult. And so we were, um, at that same time in the six month mark, our daughter was in need of, um, formula. And how many of you guys who have little ones know that formula could be very expensive, right? It's, it could be expensive. And so she was in need of formula. And, um, it's during that time where I just started to wonder, God, like, I'm not making much. My wife's not making making anything at the moment. Um, is, it, is it even worth tithing? If it's like, I, I think I could take care of this. We need every little extra cash we can. On top of that, I tried to get state assistance because everyone was like, hey, there's no shame in it. And then when I went there, the lady said, you make like, I forgot, it was like $50 too much, something ridiculous. And then on top of that, she says, hey, listen, you could, but you can say you're not married. And then we'll not only cover the food stamps, we'll also cover the electric bill and half the rent. And the temptation was real. I was like, man, that's pretty nice. Uh, but I told the lady, I said, hey, you don't know me. I don't really know you. My name's Edwin. You know that from the paperwork. I'm a Christian. I cannot do that. And I walked away discouraged. About two days later, I get a ridiculous ax. I'm praying. Um, we, were, we were being faithful still while I'm giving, but I'm praying. And God says, I want you to give some money to a missionary who's going to Ireland, a young woman. I said, Lord, okay, we'll do like $50. He said, no. It was a lot of money. It was a good chunk of money. And I'm sitting here saying, Lord, you have to show up. But I'm going to trust you and I'm going to be obedient. And so I did it. We, I, I met the lady at church where we worked together. She was getting ready to go. Gave her the funds. And it, when I gave it to her, I was like holding tight. Like maybe she would be like, hey, I don't really need it. I already got enough money. <laughs> and then she took it. 
<laughs> and so um, to make a long story short, I went back home. I said, babes, this is tough. We're going to be in a tough situation. And within two days, this is no lie. My wife could tell you. We get a phone call from a woman. I, I was just a, a youth director at TSC at the time. I didn't really even know. I was the interim director. Didn't even know her daughter. And she said, hey, listen, we were so blessed. And we want to be a, a, a blessing to you. And this woman gave me organic formula. I didn't even know that was such a thing. She bought groceries. And it wasn't just one week. It was week after week after week. God provided and met our needs. And let me just say this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. This is Paul speaking in the, to the church of Philippi. sending a letter about God's provision. He, fit, he ends his chapter with this, verse 19. And may God and my God will supply your needs according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. When we give today, it's really a trust issue. I want to encourage you as we're getting ready to give, there's, there's a couple ways. I'm always a little bad with this on how to give online. But would you prayfully say, Lord, I'm trusting you with my finances. I'm believing you for great things. And I know that you're going to meet my needs. And you know what? He didn't just meet my needs. He met my wants. And he could do the same for you. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father, we just want to say thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness, God. Lord, we ask you, Lord, as we, we prepare to take the tithes and, and, and the funds that are coming to church, Lord, we're believing that you would do what only you can do, and that's take a dollar and stretch it a million miles. Father, we are so grateful, Lord, that you're able to do this. But, Lord, we don't do it just because we want to receive something. We do it because we want to be a blessing, oh, God. We want to be a blessing, Lord. We understand that as we bless others, you will take care of us. As we are blessing you, God, we're just saying, Father, thank you, Lord. 10% is so small to say thank you, God, for the blessing that you have given us. So, Lord, I'm believing you, Lord. I'm believing for all those who are going to give. I pray that you will bless the giving of the Lord's, uh, the giving of the Lord's tithes, Lord, this morning. And you may be glorified. May you bless everyone who's able to give. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, amen. Love you, family. God bless you guys. Christ has enriched my life by being with me, by showing me how much he has loved me and how much he has done for me and, of course, my loved ones. And I just want to find my calling so that I can help out and do what God wants me to do. My name is Diana Ramos, and I've been attending Grace Point for a year now. Once I began attending Grace Point, I immediately started taking foundation classes. I have learned a great deal about Jesus Christ. I want to learn more. I reach to read the Bible, to read uh, the Daily Bread. I read a book called Jesus Calling. I just want to learn more about him because I want to do everything that is pleasing to God. I don't want to deviate. I want to start this new life where I can give my life to him as much as I can. It was important for me to take the foundations class because I was attending another church from 2018 to 2023 and I came to realize that I needed more. I needed to learn more about Jesus Christ and I grew a desire to get baptized the same way that Jesus Christ had gotten baptized, fairly submerged, fully submerged. The Foundations class consists of a series of four sessions. It teaches you about God. It teaches you how important knowing God is. It teaches you how much God loves us and how much he has done to sacrifice his son so that we can share in eternal life with him. And it's just amazing. You go to this class and it's like in, you're in a different zone. Especially if you're new to the faith, I would encourage you to sign up for these classes because these are foundation classes which are necessary in order for you to learn more and appreciate more about 
who is Jesus Christ and how he has loved us. Praise God. Good morning, Grace Point family. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. You know, as a church, we exist to make fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And we believe that happens in a number of ways. It happens on a Sunday morning as you encounter the presence of God in worship and as you hear the word. Uh, but we also see it happening through our community groups. Those are starting up again. Some of this week, some next week, I want to encourage you, find a place to plug in and be in community with other believers. It's a place where you can learn about and, and talk about the sermons, discuss how you apply those in your life. But I also want to encourage you because we started last year these foundations classes, and there are a number of people that have gone through all, well, they're going on to the fourth class now, but we're about to start next week our first class again. And I want to encourage you, if you're new to the faith, or maybe you've been a Christian for a while, but you can't answer some uh, questions uh, the way that you think you should, like in terms of how do I know that I'm saved? How do I have assurance of salvation? What is my relationship to the church? What has God called me to do? What is baptism all about, right? All those kind of basic foundational questions. Again, if, if you're new to the faith, I want to encourage you, sign up for our foundations class, but maybe you've been a believer for some time and you just want to build a foundation, okay? Encourage you to take part. Those will happen at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. So if you're a first service attender, maybe for that first class that's eight weeks long, you just want to switch things around. Come here at 10 o'clock and then stay for the second service. But regardless, I do want to encourage you. We've seen uh, just tremendous growth, great testimonies coming out of these foundations class. I want to encourage you to be a part of them. We also have one happening for youth that will be at 1230 on Sunday starting next week, okay? And so encourage you uh, to get plugged in. also want to encourage you uh, this week on Thursday at 4 p.m. our police officers Bible study is happening, all right? So any law enforcement, want to encourage you to come out. That's a, a, always a great gathering. Well, I'm excited today to introduce some guests to you, and they're not really guests. They're more like family. Pastor Mike Esposito and Terrell are with us today. There is so much that I could say about this guy, and most of it is good. No, I'm just kidding. But Mike was uh, raised up here in Grace Point. He was discipled under the ministry of my father, Carl Johnson. Uh, he was my youth pastor for a while, Pastor Sadie and I. A blessing in our lives before he and Tara were sent out to the mission field a number of years ago. And so it is a, just a blessing. He deposited a great word yesterday with our men that were here for a men's breakfast. And I know he has something for us today. He's going to give an update on the ministry. And then we're going to give you a chance to, to give uh, to that work before he shares the word. So welcome, Mike. Praise the Lord. Well, good morning, Grace Point. I was told I could not have a bottle of water up here. They were supposed to give me a cup with the name of the church on it. And I said, if I have to advertise for the church, it's going to cost you money. <laughs> so they gave me a cup with no name on it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Anyway, good morning, church. Um, I just want to say I brought this beautiful lady with me. Terrell, please stand up because people don't know you, some people. Uh, my, my, my wife, my partner in life in the ministry for 37 years. And uh, praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah, she definitely needs a hand clap, I can tell you that. Uh, <laughs> and um, I just want to, before we show a video and I give you a quick update because I have so much to tell you this morning, I just want to thank everyone who has prayed for us uh, over the many, many years that Terrell and I have been sent out from Grace Point. If you don't know, you, your church supports us. And many of you personally support us. And if you support us through push pay, uh, we don't know who you are, but we want to thank you for your financial investment that you make into our lives. We're missionaries, and um, we, we live through the faithfulness of God through, through people. And so we want to thank you very much. If you did not give, then the reality is we could never do what we do. And a lot is going on. The Lord is doing a lot. And the other thing is your prayers. And when missionaries come up and, and say thank you for your prayers, uh, we really mean that because there are times when we, we work and labor in the Lord, we get exhausted, and we can't even pray, to be honest. And uh, so your prayers help sustain us, protect us, and empower us. So thank you for all of that this morning. Um, you can roll the video, and I'll give a quick update, okay?
Praise the Lord. So, <clears throat> excuse me, for those of you who pray and give, that's just a snapshot of what uh, goes on all year round in the Yucatan Peninsula in, in Mexico. So quickly, I'll tell you that our full-time um, our full-time Christian Academy is now accredited by the ACE organization. And uh, so our students now, if they meet all the um, requirements, can actually graduate with uh, USA documents. So it's an accredited school. We Praise the Lord. They could, uh, we now have 34 full-time students, K through, through uh, 12th grade. And we're looking to have nine more students sponsored by next year, 2025 school year. Uh, Saturday school... Uh, where kids can't really afford to go to school or attend the uh, academy. We have a Saturday academic school and Christian school for 200 students every Saturday. We build homes for, for students' families, distribute food every month to, to over 160 people. We have medical brigades, as you saw, every quarter to minister to the needs of the people. We have chiropractors, we have medical doctors, we have dentists, we have optometrists, and we make glasses right on our site uh, for the people in Kunamaya. We have short-term missions teams, and we conduct two discipleship training schools uh, a, a year, and that's where um, Pastor Daniel's uh, children are going and have gone uh, this coming uh, very soon, as far as I understand. And we train up missionary, uh, young missionaries and young leaders for church work through our DTS schools, and we conduct uh, one, of, uh, one, one school of the Bible every year. I have to read this or I'll just babble. Uh, two new things we're doing. If you could put up the slide for the podcast, that would be wonderful. Um, there we go. If you have an iPhone, you can open up to podcasts. If you listen to podcasts and just search for Journey Toward Legacy and uh, please subscribe if you would. Uh, I'm giving a lot of my life lessons and a lot of principles I learned, and uh, we've been doing this for a while, so you could do that. Uh, the other thing is I began life coaching, and if any men are interested, between the ages of 25 and 45 in life coaching, you can scan the QR code on the back table where our books are. And then lastly, uh, our book uh, on the Holy Spirit, The Promise of the Father, is for sale. This book, uh, Dr. Carl Johnson, my mentor... Uh, helped me develop this book just as he was dying. Actually, we finished it um, just days before he, he passed on. And you know what I found out? That yesterday was my mentor, Pastor Carl Johnson's uh, anniversary of him going home to see the Lord. It was four years yesterday that he went home to see the Lord. And so I miss him and I love him. And it's very interesting because a lot of what he's imparted to me through the years I was able to impart to Daniel and, and Pastor Sadie. And uh, now, uh, where he used to be my youth group kid, him and his wife, now I have to listen to him because now he's my boss. So <laughs> praise the Lord for that. Come on, brother. We pray that they would know your provision and your faithfulness. We thank you this morning for the opportunity to partner with them in the kingdom work that they're doing. We give you thanks. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Just want to say Amen. if you're giving through push pay, you can just designate it to Missions Esposito. God bless you. Warm my heart, buddy. Oh. Okay, open your Bibles uh, to John chapter 20. Um, my intention this morning is a couple of things. Uh, it's to substantiate that there are two distinct and separate works and experiences of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And uh, we want to know uh, why is there two distinct separate experiences of the same one Holy Spirit? And uh, what is the reason for that in our lives? We're also going to see when the disciples were born again and the new covenant began. 
And to substantiate these truths, I'm going to take you through a timeline of the first thing that Jesus said on the first day of his resurrection. And I'm going to take you on a timeline to the last thing Jesus said as he ascended to heaven. And then uh, we're going to look into the book of Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2. So uh, the only way we could really understand who God is is not through church doctrine necessarily, uh, through, um, uh, you know, maybe traditional beliefs, but the way that we find out who God truly is, is through the scripture. So this morning, we're going to read a lot of scripture, okay? So open your Bibles to John chapter 20, and we'll begin. On the evening of the first day of the week... When the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. Remember that word, for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed him his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. I'll I'll break that down in modern day terms. When Jesus showed up and materialized in that room that first night, you could imagine these guys were freaked out. And basically what he was saying is, hey, guys, don't freak out. I'm here. Everything that I have said is coming true. So be at peace. And as the Father, he says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them. And he said, receive Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they're forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. There's so much going on in this passage. First night, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And he's addressing us, everyone in this place today, by saying that. And what is Jesus saying when he says, as as my Father sent me, I'm sending you? He's saying is, the Father sent me with all the authority of the kingdom of heaven to do the works of the kingdom of heaven and to proclaim the message of salvation. And so that one sentence is the whole great commission in that one sentence. Because Jesus said earlier in in Matthew chapter uh, 28, 18 to 20, he said, all authority has been given to me. Now you go and preach the gospel to every living creature. And baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey, you know, all that I've taught you. So in that one sentence, he's giving them the great commission. And then he says, and with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, some uh, conservative commentators would say this. They would say, when Jesus breathed on them, that... uh, That was a promise of the Holy Spirit from uh, 50 days from that. It was a promise that 50 days later they would receive the Holy Spirit. There was nothing in the language that says anything like that. And then some other uh, conservative commentators would say, well, they got half of the Holy Spirit that day, but 50 days later they were filled with the Holy Spirit totally. There's nothing in the language that says that. Now, for the sake of time, I will quote to you uh, Genesis 2-7. God formed the man out of mud, of the ground, and he formed man. And then he, it says this in in Genesis 2-7, and he breathed (sighs) his spirit into that mud, and it became a physical and a spiritual living being. Now, we know that we, you know, we're here naturally, but we know that sin has separated us from God and we are spiritually dead if we're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? So, Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Nicodemus being a high, a high priest, uh, he had asked Jesus a question and Jesus looked at him and said, Nicodemus, unless you're born from above, unless you're born of my father, Unless you're born of the Spirit, Nicodemus, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, if you're not born from above or by my Father's Spirit, by the Spirit from above, you cannot see, you cannot, you cannot understand, and you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
This was the night the disciples were born again. They became alive in the Holy Spirit. That was the night. The Bible says uh, that was the night the new covenant began that Jesus spoke about. And the Bible says because the Holy Spirit was breathed into them and they were born again, according to uh, Romans 8, uh, 12 through 16, that they had become now the living children of God. And if you've been born again, then you are the living children of God. If you have been born again, then God has given you all authority. You may not feel like it, but God has given you all authority to proclaim the gospel and the authority of heaven to do the works of heaven in this world. And, and so uh, the reality was is that God breathed his spirit into them and they became born again. And then it says, and with that, he breathed on them, said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. Well, is Jesus saying here that you have authority to forgive sins or me? No. In the context of authority, the kingdom of heaven, proclaiming the message, we have the authority to announce sins forgiven based on a person's repentance and the reception of Jesus Christ as their God and Savior. If someone does that, you have the authority to say, because of your confession of faith, you are now forgiven your sins and you now are a child of God. In the same way, if you speak to someone about Christ and they reject Christ, you have the authority of God to say, because of your rejection of Jesus Christ, you are still in your sin and you are, you are going to, to die in hell. Very simple message, but you have the authority to say that. So Jesus Gives them, gives them the commission. They become born again. The new covenant begins. And now let's look at the timeline. Because remember, we want to see if there's a difference in an empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So moving along, uh, in, verse 20, in verse 26, uh, a week later, it was a week later, the disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. So Jesus showed up a week later. And then in chapter 21, verse 1, afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. So Jesus was showing up, and he showed up for 40 days. It's, it says here um, that he appeared to his brothers in Acts 1-3. He appeared to his brothers for 40 days. And uh, we see in uh, 1 Corinthians 15-6 that Jesus was seen by 500 brothers all at one time. Now, go with me to, to Luke 24. Luke 24 and verse 45. Now, we want to look at the last thing Jesus said to these guys before he ascended before their eyes. Excuse me. Then he opened their minds, Luke 24, 45. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. The disciples were walking to Bethany on the road to Bethany with him. And he told them this, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem, you are my my witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised Now, this is the last thing he says, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. My father is going to send you that promise. And when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and stayed continually at at the temple praising God. Now, when did the Father promise the disciples? What was the promise? Well, if you read in John, the Last Supper, starting in chapter 13, and you read through chapter 17, we we learn, of course, that Jesus washes the disciples' feet, and we know that we are to be servants to one another as as Christian people, servants. And then we know that he, he introduced the elements, the bread and the wine, to do this in remembrance of me. The commun- we call it communion. But do you know what he talked about mostly between 13 and 17? 
he talked about who the Holy Spirit was, what his ministries would be in our lives, that the Father promised he would come. Jesus said to them, he said, the Holy, the Holy Spirit is with you, but a day is coming when Holy Spirit will be in you. And so um, this is what he's telling you. He's saying, and you should not, listen, this is your commission. He t- tells them again, but do not, do not do this. Do not intend to do this mission until you are clothed with power from my Father on high. The first day, born again. The last day, go and wait for the promise of the power of the Spirit of God to be clothed with power to be able to accomplish the things my Father has asked you to do. Well, it seems like there's going to be another move of the Holy Spirit in the lives of God's people. Would you agree, yes or no? I I think so. Okay. So let's go to the book of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Now, we know that the book of Acts was authored by Luke, and we just read what Luke said at the end of Luke. And so I'm going to read a bunch of scripture here. In my former book, Theolopius, I wrote all about what Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. And after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John, for John baptized you with water. But in a few days, you will, not maybe, not could be, not might be, but wait, because in a few days, you will be baptized, filled, covered, flowing, baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you going to do this to to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, listen, you're kind of, you're not understanding what I'm telling you. He says, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now listen, when he says, wait for the promise and the power The Greek word for power used in that scripture is the word deutimus. And we get our English word, we get our English word dynamite from the word deutimus. And so what Jesus is saying, wait for the promise of my father to send you the explosive power of the Holy Spirit so that you can go out into the world and to proclaim the gospel, you know, in his, in his power and, and do the work of the ministry. The power of God, the spirit of God, not the flesh. You see, when the spirit of God comes in and he comes in, he will destroy the power of sin in your life. When the spirit of God comes in, he will cleanse your intention. When the spirit of God comes in, he will give you power beyond human power to be able to accomplish the work and live the life of Christ in your very natural everyday life. That same thing that happened back then is available today. And we're going to need to continue to to read. Praise God. Now listen. I don't have time for all this, but if we read about Jesus when he got baptized, it said when he got baptized and he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended upon him. In something that looked like a dove. And it said the Holy Spirit came and lived on him and stayed with him. And it said the Holy Spirit led him out into the desert to be tempted for 40 days. That's what the Holy Spirit did. 
led him to be tempted. And after his 40 days of being tempted and, and not sinning, he came out, and the Bible says in Luke chapter 4, and he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And what did he do when he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit? He went and he began to proclaim the gospel. Now, listen, <laughs> listen, if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, if the disciples needed the Holy Spirit, then I need the Holy Spirit. And you need the power of the Holy Spirit. If you think you can live this natural life just by some head knowledge, and, and, and listen, I'm a big Bible reader, you could see. But if you think you can live this life just with some kind of head knowledge of, of the Bible or about Jesus or God's truth, without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, I will tell you today on the authority of God's word, you're 100% wrong. Let's continue to read. So moving down, let's see, where do we want to go? Uh, go to chapter 2, Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, the day of Pentecost means 50th. And so it was now the 50th day from the day that Jesus first resurrected until he ascended. It was 50 days later. He ascended after 40 days, 10 more days. The disciples, 120 of them, were praying and waiting for the promise of the Father. And by the way, the church has forgotten how to wait upon the Lord. Just saying. Maybe not here, but I travel a lot of places. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly the sound, uh, the sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Okay, stop there. Fire in the scripture basically represents three things. The presence of God, God in the burning bush, the consuming fire of God. We see God through the Old Testament appearing, his appearance is in fire. We see that fire is, is a refining fire, which means that it cleanses our life. The refining fire of God cleansing us. And then we see that fire represents separation from God and from hell. And the scripture here says something that seemed to be like tongues of fire came and fell on the 120 guys that were waiting. And it says that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. We'll explain that in a second. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? And then it lists 15 different people groups that were there. Verse 11, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Okay, that day, those tongues were not a heavenly tongue. It was supernatural, but it wasn't a heavenly tongue that needed an interpretation to bless and encourage the congregation. That tongue was not a personal prayer language although all of those things are available to us today, that was what we call, or the Bible calls, a sign gift. It was a sign. When, when these men were speaking in a language not their own, it was a supernatural sign that God was present, and what they were doing was proclaiming the word of God. And so what God was saying was that this message of salvation it's for all mankind, every tongue, tribe, every color, every race, every creed. It was a sign gift. Everything God does, there's a purpose. So that was what was happening in that day when it says they were speaking in other tongues. God was telling everybody that his message was for them. Moving on. Then Peter stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Stop. 
Peter denied Jesus three times, correct? If you know your Bible, right? Yes. Oh, Jesus, I'll never deny you. Eh, yeah, you will. No, I will never deny you. Eh, eh, you will. Jesus, never. You're gonna. And three times, Jesus denies Christ. And the third time, when he denies Christ, Jesus turns around and looks right at him when the, co when the crow, uh, whatever, cried. And then he went away ashamed. But now... Now that the Spirit of God has come upon Peter and these other men, Peter the coward becomes Peter the lion. Peter the fearful becomes Peter the emboldened. He becomes, he becomes unashamed. He becomes courageous. And he becomes bold. Because in my mind... As Peter begins this sermon, he's not standing there giving a sermon. I believe that he stood up on a rock so everyone can see him. No more fear, no more hiding, standing on a rock. And he begins to proclaim this message. And he says, um, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he's about to tell them that the prophecy in Joel, chapter 2, and verse 28, is happening right before their eyes. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even in my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood, fire, billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and the glorious day of the Lord. Listen to this. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What are the last days? Well, the last days are from the day Jesus ascended before their eyes in a cloud into heaven until he returns, the Bible says, by coming back through that same clouds, cracking the sky, and those who are alive in Christ will rise to meet him in the air, and then the grave in the ocean and it will give up their dead, those who died in Christ, and will meet him in the air and forever be with the Lord. We are living in the last days is my point. These are the last days. And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about, I want to focus on in the last days, the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out upon God's people, upon all flesh, upon men, women, young and old, slave and free. That means everyone in the room qualifies for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I don't know about you, but I don't have a lot of time, but I don't believe God knits you together beautifully and wonderfully in your mother's womb. And then when you're born, he says, you, you're destined for hell, but you, I like you, you go to heaven. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. If you're in this room today, listen to me carefully. If you're in this room today and you've never called out to God to save you, I am telling you right now, you're dead in your sins. And if you die, you will die separate from God. And that's not a joke because you will be eternally separated from him and never see him again, never taste the goodness of God or life ever again. And you can today, in this day, in this service, very simply, if you mean it, <clears throat> because it's not necessarily the words, there's no magic prayer, <clears throat> excuse me, you just say, Jesus, save me. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, be my Lord. If you mean that in your heart and you say that even under your breath or during worship, God will save you, God will forgive you, and God will make you his child. Because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved.
Praise God. Now, P- Peter, after he says that, now he gets really emboldened. For, l- listen, the book of Acts is not about speaking in tongues. The book of Acts is about the acts of the disciples that have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring the kingdom of God and the message of God throughout the whole world. That's what the book of Acts is all about. And now we look at Peter. He's bold, he's courageous, and he's unashamed, and he's preaching. This is an unlearned man, and he's preaching not through intelligence or, or, or through personality. He's now preaching by the power of the Holy Spirit in him, and God is about to use him to save 3,000 people in one minute. And so Peter stands there, and he says, men of Israel, listen to this. Now he's not a coward anymore. You guys who are going to kill us, You men, listen to what I'm about to tell you. Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, you, with the help of wicked men, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep his hold on him. Now we go to verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said, Peter, And said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? They're cut to the heart. They're screaming out, what shall we do? In reference to what what do we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The, The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off for all who the Lord our God will call. And 3,000 men were saved in that minute. Let's look at two things, two or three things here. I want to tell you a couple of stories. They were cut to the heart. You know what that means? By Peter's preaching, the Holy Spirit deeply convicted these people. So deeply convicted these people, they were screaming, what shall we do? Don't you want your words to have the power of the Holy Spirit? You're Christian people, I I guess most of you. And for you who aren't, cry out to God and get saved. But you have that spirit of God in you. And when you talk about Jesus and give your testimony or talk about the scripture, don't you want people to be like, what must I do? Peter was nothing special. Peter was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. That made him special. And then the second thing was, um, he says, uh, if you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, all whom the Lord our God will call. Again, some conservative commentators will say, well, he was speaking of only people in a different geographical area. Well, that was true because these these, these, uh, Christians were sent out into the whole world. But all who far off, all who the Lord our God will call. If you're sitting here as a Christian today, you've been called. You've been called. And so you are a candidate to be filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit Now, is the filling of the Holy Spirit... Now, listen, you're born again, you're born again, you're born again. You don't get born again and unborn again. (laughs) You're born again. But then there's the empowerment of Holy Spirit. Does it happen once? And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But I want to just give you a couple of quick stories. Now, I am a very unlearned man. I've never been in Bible school. I took a few courses with Moody Bible Institute, 
My knowledge comes from the mentoring of Dr. Carl Johnson, my mentor for six years, and through the study and the reading of the Word of God and by the revelation of the Spirit of God. I do not say that proudly, but I am telling you the only reason why I have any Bible knowledge is because the Holy Spirit has revealed it to me and taught me as I've studied and, and, and I've prayed, and he has done this. Okay? One day... February 21st, 1980, I gave my heart to Christ. If you don't know, before that time, for about uh, five years, I was a drug addict. I was stoned every day. I'm not kidding you. Smoked pot, snorted coke, ate every pill I could find, drank, was a womanizer, was rebellious, And one night, February 21st, 1980, when I was told the gospel, I didn't even know if it was true, but I wanted it to be true. So I held hands with my cousin and my brother, their wives, and I said, Lord Jesus, if it's true, forgive me my sins and be my God and be my savior. And all of a sudden, smash. I was smashed to the floor. Now, the people praying for me were only Christians three months. They had no idea what happened to me. Now I'm laying on the floor, and I'm hearing them talk, and they want me to respond, and I cannot respond. And all the while, my body is filling up with heat, so much so that now sweat is pouring out of me, and it looks like I just went into the shower with my clothes on. But I can't get up, and I hear my brother say, Sal, you killed my brother. And they pick me up, and like a drunk man, they set me on the couch. That next morning, I woke up. Drug addiction disappeared, gone, delivered. Praise the Lord. Yes, clap for Jesus. Drinking, gone. Womanizing, gone. Fear, fear of death, fear of devils, fear of dark, gone. Got the rock of cocaine, threw it down the toilet, never went to get the money in the streets, and I was delivered for the rest of my life. I took a hit on a joint twice since that time, and it was so disgusting I threw it away. That doesn't happen naturally. That happened because the power, not only was I saved that night, but for some reason by God's divine choice, he came into my life in power and he delivered me and he changed me. And from that day on, I was crazy about talking about Jesus. I, I, I was, I am. I'm, 45 years later, I'm still crazy about Jesus. Now, right after that, we went back to this place called Maximus in New City. It was a bar we used to drink at and pick up chicks. And Carl and me and some other guys, Pastor Carl used to have a black van. Remember the black van when you were a kid? And we'd go in the black van, and then we'd open up the doors, and we'd start preaching to all the people, all the young people on the line going into the bar. And one day, I jump out of the van, and I had all these Bible tracks And I took these Bible tracts, and I was going down the line and giving them to people. And then I get to this one guy. He's like 6'5". I'm like 5'8". Sadie, I'm lying. Be quiet. (laughs) But but I'm I'm not 6'5". So I get the track, and I get the track, and I put it in this guy's pocket. I reach up, and I said... You need to give your life to Jesus. You need to repent. And this big dude looks at me and he goes, he's telling the truth. He's telling the truth. And he ran off the line from going into the bar. Can I do that? No. Can the Holy Spirit do that? Yes. Now, I used to sometimes go down uh, to, to Main Street in the city. And I would stop at red lights. True story. Excuse me. Whew. I would stop at the red light and I would get out of my car and I would jump on the hood and I would start to preach to everybody at the red light. These guys will tell you, red light. All of a sudden, the window rolls down and this guy lo- looks at me and he says some choice words to me. And I look down and it's my buddy, Phil Triano from high school. 
We pull into the parking space, tell him about Jesus. His sister comes to the Bible study we used to have, Rose. We used to have at Sal's house. She got saved, right? Okay, so I'm giving this same, not the same, but a similar message on the Holy Spirit in this church, excuse me, on a Saturday night in the little, the little chapel. And when I'm done, this kid walks up to me, man. He says, hi, my name is Mike Triano. I'm Phil Triano's son. He said, I got saved, me and my wife, two weeks ago. And we were praying about where to go to church, and we were looking for churches, and we wound up here today. What is the possibility of that happening by chance? My, my, my hair just stood up. The next day, I preach in the big church. When I'm done, who comes walking down the aisle? Phil Triano. Only God can do that stuff. The other day, I was in, in Starbucks. Now, listen, where I live now, it's cattle country. Literally. We have the biggest cattle farms in Oregon. Don't ask me why I'm there. It's a sore subject. Talk to my wife. In, in, in any case, so I live in cattle country. Now, people in cattle country got overalls, suspenders. They're working people. They're working hard. Me? When I'm in town, I'm walking around in a black Adidas tracksuit. So I am, sometimes blue, green, whatever. So I, I go, I frequent the same uh, Starbucks coffee shop, right? And every time I walk in, the baristas all get together. I know what they're saying. Who is this guy? So one day I come up to the counter and they finally have the nerve and they say, who are you? What, you do? what do you do? And I looked at him as serious as could be, and I said, I'm from New York. They sent me here. <laughs> so, so, now, so now time goes on. Time goes on. And just two weeks ago, they finally had a, you know, like, please tell us what you do. You're in the mob, right? You're part of the mob. <laughs> and so I told one of the girls, I said, don't ever say that. <laughs> so... So finally that day, I said, listen, come here. It was like 10 a.m. For some reason, customers weren't coming in. And I said, come here. This is my life. And I told them my testimony. I told them what I used to be. And I told them what Jesus made me to be. You see, this is what the Holy Spirit does. He empowers us to be unashamed gives us power to be courageous, authentic, and bold for the kingdom of God. And every morning when I get up, my wife can tell you when we go for prayer drives, I cry out to God. I cry out to God every morning. I repent. I think of sins I've committed. I ask him to forgive me. And I say, Father, please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Please empower me with your Holy Spirit that I may proclaim the gospel wherever I am, anytime, with anyone, anywhere. It's not because I'm a preacher that I have this empowerment. It's because I'm a son of God. It's because I ask for him to empower me and I repent of my sins. And so is it an experience you receive once in your life like salvation? No. Okay. I'm not even looking at the clock, so don't look at me, guys. So in, I'm not, I can't go through the whole story, but in Acts chapter 4, is there a continuing filling of the, of the Holy Spirit? In Acts chapter 4, we think that this happened, this, this message happened like right away. But this was years later. And quickly, you can read chapter 4 yourself. Excuse me. But quickly, um, Peter and John had healed somebody. God had healed somebody through Peter and John. And the Sanhedrin and the religious people were kind of aggravated with them because people were turning to them and to their message and to Jesus Christ. And they are threatened by these, these authorities never to speak in the name of Jesus again. And, and Peter says, again, boldly, who am I supposed to listen to? Am I supposed to obey you or, or, or God? And so they warned them strongly and they sent them out. 
Okay, got the story? Now going uh, into verse 27, now Peter and John go back to the other disciples and they're praying, and they're praying. And it says in verse 27, in their prayer, indeed Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak the word with boldness and stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. The Spirit of God, I don't know, I'm not a heavy theologian, but the scripture is very plain. Again, they were filled. And again, they were filled. And they were given the power to proclaim. And God do miracles through their life. And when it says they were witnesses, you know, at the beginning when they were commissioned, the word witness actually means martyr. And they had the power of God to lay down their lives for the sake of the gospel. And then finally, last scripture, um, worship team, you can come back, please, if you would. In Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, or verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now listen to me. When it says to be filled with the Spirit, the actual Greek text says be filled, continually filled with the Spirit of God. It is an experience you and I should experience over and over and over again. So as the worship team plays, I'm going to give you time to ask, ask God, ask the Father to fill you with his spirit and with his power. Now, there are three things I would say as this is happening. One, we need to repent of our sins because the Holy Spirit can't be grieved in your life and, and give you an empowerment. So you really need to examine your heart and repent. Number two, you, if you really want the empowerment of Holy Spirit, surrender your life. A lot of times we hold on to different compartments of our life. You can't do that. If you want to be filled with the power of God, just say, and whatever you say, but just release, Lord, I release myself, have your way in my life. And then lastly, I would just say, ask him. Your Father in heaven gives good gifts to us, and even the Holy Spirit if we ask him. So take this time and ask God to do what he will in your life. Ask him to fill you, empower you, cleanse you, change you, make you bold, courageous, unashamed. Because we need him. In this evil, God-hating world, more than ever, we need the empowerment of Holy Spirit. Take this time and ask him to fill you. If you don't know Jesus, but you really want to in your heart, just say, Lord, forgive me. Be my savior. Come into my life. He'll do that. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Father, give us your spirit this morning. Power your church, Lord, I pray. Just receive the Holy Spirit this morning. Let him fill you this morning. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit.
Holy Spirit, come and fill your people this morning, oh God. Lord, we need you. Empower your people, Father. Come powerfully into their lives today, oh God. Spirit, move on your people this morning. Fill your people this morning, Father. Empower your people this morning, Father. Change your people this morning. Embolden your people, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, come. spirit this morning. Cry out to him to fill you this morning. Let him change and empower your life and do it again and again and again. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit. Spirit of the living God. Spirit of the living God. We're leaning into all you are. Everything else can win.
thankful this morning that you can receive that promise of the Holy Spirit. Listen, church, there is no way you can live the life that God's calling you to live, especially in the time that we're in without the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And so as you wake up each day, I pray that would be your prayer. Say, God, power me today. Fill me today. Receive that fresh anointing that you need. He knows what you stand in need of for that day, even before you step into it. And so, Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for that promised Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you come and you indwell us, you empower us, Lord God. And so this week, may we be aware, Lord, aware of, Lord, how you're leading us and directing us. May we be attentive to your voice. And Lord, I, I thank you this morning that we've been had this opportunity to be the church gathered, to be encouraged by your word, to be strengthened, Lord God, to be filled once again with your spirit. But I pray as we go out of these doors that we would understand that we are called also to be the church scattered. And so by the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray that we would open our mouths and our workplaces and in our homes, that we would declare boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you would use us this week for your glory and for your name. Lord God, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise God. God bless you as you go today, church. We're back together Tuesday night for prayer. I encourage you to come out 7 p.m. for a time of worship and prayer. You can connect with Mike and Terrell. They're going to be out in the lobby there uh, if you want to know more about what they're doing and get involved. God bless you as you go, church.